So let me first briefly introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Michael Berry and um, from UCLA. And he's very, very, very well known in China, uh, in America and uh, uh, across the globe. Professor Michael Berry, who's a Chinese name is a Bay Raven. He's an internationally renowned scholar of Chinese studies, particularly in Chinese literature and Chinese cinema. Uh, he has written and edited 10 books on Chinese literature and the cinema, including the latest one, Enter the Clowns, the Queer Cinema of Cui Zien, uh, Cui Zien, the Queer Xiang, uh, which is the topic of his keynote spe speech. He's also a, a author and a very well-known literary translator. He's a translation of Chinese novels, including The Song of Everlasting Sorrow, a novel of Shanghai by the very famous novelist Wang Anyi, and also another one, To Live, by Yu Hua. And his latest translation project is a dystopia science fiction, fiction uh, hospital trilogy by Han Song, which includes hospital, uh, exorc exorcism and dead souls. So his keynote speech will introduce Cui Zien, a very important um, filmmaker uh, in, in China. And his background, his body of work, uncompromising aesthetic stance and contributions to the queer movement in China. Because of the clash of this forum with Professor Barry's travel commitment, so we have asked uh, Professor Barry to pre-record his speech. Good afternoon, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Michael Barry from the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA. And it's a great honor to be with everyone virtually for this uh, Chinese Queer Voices workshop. I wanna thank the organizers, in particular Jing Han for reaching out to me for the invitation. And uh, I can't wait to engage with everyone during today's forum. And my topic, Enter the Clowns, an introduction to Cui Zian's literary and cinematic aesthetics is it's not, uh, I have to be forthright, it's not the most theoretical or academic presentation. It's more of an overview of the work of one of the more iconic individuals who has been working in the field of literature and film uh, in mainland China for the last several decades. And in part of what I'm doing is also in celebration of a recent book launch uh, from a project in which I collaborated with Tui last year. Uh, that book, in Chinese, entitled Chou Jiao Deng Chang, Cui Zian the Kuo Ying Xiang, or Enter the Clowns, the Queer Cinema of Cui Zian, is actually the result of a long-term collaboration between myself and Mr. Cui. It was probably more than 15 years ago that I first hosted Cui Zian when he visited uh, Un University of California in Santa Barbara for a series of film screenings and workshops, discussions, dialogues. And somehow I had the foresight at that time to record a lot of our dialogues and we did some interviews, uh, a lot of the post-screening Q and A's. At the time, there was absolutely no plans for a book publication. But over the years, we would periodically, every couple of years, reunite and under different circumstances for different events and do more dialogues for more screenings. And over time, it created a record of Tsui's evolution as an artist, a record of his cinematic journey. And finally, during the period of the pandemic, it seemed like an opportune time to sit down and reflect upon this body of work, put it together to edit it, curate it into eventually what became this publication. Uh, I should say that it's a little unique because it's not a straight record of our dialogues. What I did was it, it began that way. And when I took the manuscript and sent it to Mr. Tsui for his evaluation and revisions, he ended up almost doubling the length of the manuscript by adding a lot of new material uh, based on the structure and questions that were originally present, but also making it much richer and uh, more comprehensive in terms of an overview on his upbringing, his childhood, coming of age, uh, 
discussions of many of his major works, both in literature and film. And so it became a really important record, uh, I think also personally for Mr. Tsui, a kind of a form for him to re reflect upon this incredible body of work. I have to say another impetus behind putting the book together has to do with the very unique cultural sphere in China over the last decade or so. In particular, the last five or six years, we have seen a tightening of restrictions, a tightening of censorship, the space for cultural expression on a number of different levels, including reflections on sensitive historical moments in modern Chinese history, and in particular, expressions of queerness, of uh, opportunities for members of the LGBTQ community to voice themselves and to create and to uh, create a, a unique space has been disappearing. Uh, we probably many people, I think in the Zoom room might remember a few years ago uh, when there was a top-down directive calling for uh, more masculine representations in popular culture and dissuading various artists and pop stars from portraying themselves in a more uh, kind of feminine light, quote unquote. And so we've been seeing this kind of trend uh, gradually grab hold and become increasingly tenacious to the point that about a decade ago, uh, Tsui Zan had numerous books in print within China. Today, I don't think there are any publishers in mainland China that would publish any of his works. And so it's in the face of this wave of disappearance that I, I personally looked at this project as almost an having carrying activist meaning, that is uh, carrying a thrust of cultural preservation in the face of so much disappearance and so much that is being taken away. Uh, and so I think hopefully that also serves as maybe a model for other scholars who can find constructive ways to incorporate activism into their work and look at their work as not just detached analysis of these cultural products, but also ways in which we can, through scholarship, uh, highlight, give support, and augment the voices of, of those whose ability to create and express themselves is being taken away. A little bit about Tsui Zan. I think we're going to start with some background. And I love this image here. Uh, this is an image that you often often see online of Tsui Zan. Uh, and the caption here, I'm uh, playing a little bit, will the real Tsui Zan please stand up? Because there are many in, uh, manifestations of who Tsui is as an artist. He simultaneously engages with so many different fields, so many different uh, uh, areas of the contemporary Chinese cultural sphere, so much that I think there are those out there who only know Tsui the writer and others who only know Tsui the filmmaker, and yet other audiences who maybe only know Tsui Zan the activist. And so with these different kind of identities in motion, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about who Tsui is today in my presentation and just give a real brief overview of some of his major contributions uh, over the course of his career to date. Tsui Zan was born in 1958 in Harbin uh, in Northeast China. He was raised in a Catholic family and still considers himself Catholic. Uh, later, he went on to study literature, was a kind of a taiza, like a, like a genius <laughs> for his precocity in, in terms of uh, his knowledge of literature as a young man and his avid, broad reading and how much world literature, both East and West, from Western theory uh, to traditional Chinese literature that he had mastered at a very young age. Uh, he went on to earn a master's degree in Chinese literature from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and later was employed at Beijing Film Academy, first as a professor, later when his ability to teach was taken away, he stayed on as a researcher. And he was there at the Beijing Film Academy uh, during some of the most exciting periods when the sixth generation was rising and a whole new group of young, innovative, experimental filmmakers were just coming up. And so he was not only 
there to witness that, but he was a part of that movement, which I'll also be talking about. He's also a very important early voice amongst the first generation uh, of LGBTQ activists in China. And so he's one of the first kind of public figures to come out and to go on television shows, radio shows, and really become a voice of queer culture during its early burgeoning period. Um, and with that, he also took on a role as a public intellectual. And so Sui's impact was far beyond the academy, so to speak. And I think he really became an icon for that early first generation of uh, queer scholars, of people from the queer community who were looking for a model or someone in the public that was brave enough to step out and, and speak for so many causes that were important to the LGBT community during that period. And then I think he is known probably best for his creative body of work. And what I really wanna to emphasize today is the diversity of that body of work and how it really challenges so many models when we think of a famous writer or a famous filmmaker, people tend to do one thing and do one thing well. Uh, Tsui Zan is so unique because he does so many different things and has such had such a profound impact on this disparate, uh, these different, uh, this, 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 these different uh, fields. He started out as a literary critic, and so he is published in literary criticism. He is also a fiction writer. He has made numerous experimental films, documentary films. He is an essayist. He has also written the screenplay and served as a producer on numerous projects. And so his contributions are extremely varied. And that's why I want to try to unpack some of that today. And I'm going to begin with a quote, actually, from the book that we collaborated on. Uh, and so here says, 我就是注定了永远边缘，再边缘更边缘，与任何神、任何神话、任何偶像、任何主流作对。So I am destined to always be relegated to the margins, cast to the edge, and then pushed even further away, always in conflict with every god, every myth, every icon, and everything mainstream. And I think this is a powerful quote because it really encapsulates uh, Cui Zhen's stance and not only as an artist who has been kind of marginalized or pushed aside because of his identity, but also someone who actively takes this kind of avant-garde stance, standing against uh, whatever might be popular, uh, whatever might be condoned politically, uh, et, et cetera. He, he kind of has this rebellious nature, a very feisty nature in terms of uh, the way in which he positions him against all of these different things. But in that, you already start to see these overlapping categories of marginality. He, there's the, the, the triple marginality that's bian yuan zai bian yuan gong bian yuan, the, the three layers of marginality uh, that are emphasized in that quote. And you could even read that as the way in which he has been labeled by so many throughout his career for, on the one hand, being an openly gay man. I believe he first came out in 1991, which in China is fairly early, given uh, the, the, the state of queer politics in China during that time. He's also openly religious. And, uh, and so being a, a Catholic in China during this period, and especially during earlier periods of his life, is something that was certainly not only dissuaded, but uh, during his childhood, it's the kind of thing that had to be suppressed. And he talks in, in the book, we uh, he talks quite a bit about his family background and how uh, their religious beliefs had to be kind of carried out secretly, and even his own family at times were hiding it from him. And, and finally, this, I think the third kind of label of marginality here has to do with his avant-garde spirit and the, the, the experimental nature of so much of his work. And so these are aspects that I think in China during the time that he was active as a filmmaker and as a writer kind of pushed him uh, to the edge, so to speak. But he was able to kind of harness that and harness this uncompromising stance in terms of his creation, in terms of his uh, artistic world that he created. At the same time, 
I, I think that this stance creates eventually a bifurcation in terms of the reception of Tsui Zahan as an artist. And what I mean by that is, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as, as I move down the line a little bit. But to some degree, his identity as a gay man in China is, if not suppressed, but it's watered down by certain publishers, by certain film distributors, in a way that highlights the avant-garde status of his work. Uh, whereas internationally, as his films were distributed, uh, say in the United States, in Europe, uh, the opposite trend, that is the avant-garde and experimental nature of his films is downplayed, and instead the, the queerness of his work is emphasized. And so it creates, uh, I'm not sure if either side is really getting the whole picture of the complexity of this artist, um, but I think it's good to keep in mind the different ways in which his work has been appropriated, distributed, and received by markets both within and outside of China. So Cui started out, as I mentioned, as a literary scholar, and he actually published several books of literary criticism. His first major work, uh, Li Yu Xiao Shuo Leng Gao, uh, the uh, kind of uh, theory on the literary works of Li Yu. Li Yu is, of course, one of China's uh, pre-modern, late, late imperial writers who was quite well known for a lot of his erotic fiction, probably most famously, uh, The Carnal Prayer Mat, uh, Ro Pu Tuan, is uh, one of Liu's most well-known works, I think, outside of China. And uh, this was actually adapted from Cui Zhen's master's thesis. And later, he also played a role uh, on the book, book you see on the left as a kind of editor and commentator on a new collection of some of uh, Liu and other writers from that period on various collections. And so this was kind of his first mark on the world. And, and it was really a landmark work that was later quoted by scholars uh, and I, I think has really become one of the, the must-read works for scholars in late imperial literature who were studying Liu. Um, but he also didn't stop with pre-modern Chinese literature. Over the years, he's published numerous collections of essays uh, on film. Some are more scholarly, others more personal, but these are just a few examples of that, uh, such as on the right, this is the universe of artists, in the center is desire, drugs, and the soul, uh, a journey through world cinema, and on the left are cinematic memories, and so those are just three books uh, that are somewhat academic and somewhat uh, less formal that Tsui has written over the years, kind of more in his scholar guys. And then, you, of course, you have Tsui the activist. And that is as someone with his boots on the ground, really playing a crucial role in the public face of the queer rights movement in China. And he was instrumental in helping to form and organize the Chinese Gay and Lesbian Film Festival in 2001. There were other... Um, uh, queer celebration festivals that he had a really uh, important role in forming and was out there as, as a leading figure. These are two images from the UC San Diego uh, archive, which are from the first incarnation of the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival in Beijing. And you can see Cui Zhan in both of those images with some other of his colleagues, including Zhang Yuan, which you see in the center of the group photo on the right. And these are just a few uh, posters from various incarnations of that uh, Beijing uh, Queer and Lesbian Film Festival over the years, the third edition, the se sixth edition, and the seventh edition. And kind of spinning off of that, as I mentioned, so he becomes a public intellectual, a public face for the queer rights movement. And there was a handful of individuals like this. Another notable example would be uh, Li Yenhe, who was a sociologist and she wrote a book with her uh, former, with, with her with her her late husband Wang Xiaobo, who passed away. They co-edited, uh, co-authored a book called Taman the Shijia, Their World, which was the first kind of sociological, anthropological survey of queer culture in China, and it, and their work actually later would inspire Zhang Yuan's film East Palace, West Palace, which Cui Zhen also played a role in uh, behind the scenes. 
And so all of this was part of that early movement. So that, that's a little bit of a detour, but Lian He was, was another one of the kind of public faces who was out there talking about the queer movement in China alongside Cui Zhe'an. And he appeared on numerous talk shows, uh, radio shows, uh, lectures in public venues. And so these are just a few images from that aspect of you know, his identity. But I think most of us who know Cui Zhe'an know him best as a writer or as a filmmaker. And as a writer, he is the author of numerous novels that are extremely experimental. And I think that's something we want to emphasize is the parallel between the way in which in Tse's fictional universe, queer culture and experimental fiction kind of run side by side. And these are just a few of his novels, such as on the right, Wei Ke Huan Gu Shi, so pseudo science fiction stories, or in the middle, Chou uh, Jiao Deng Chang, uh, Enter the Clowns, which of course inspired our own collaboration, the title, or on the far left, Bed of Roses, uh, another one of his novels. And his novels are extremely challenging. Uh, several of them actually will experiment with different literary forms and styles with each respective chapter. So one chapter might read as a short story, a next chapter might read as a script from a spoken word drama, and then there might be another section which reads as kind of more stream of consciousness narrative. And so he was extremely bold in terms of this uh, literary journey of experimentation that he was on. And this goes hand in hand with uh, the content of the film of of the of of these stories, which again, were really pushing the limits in terms of what was permissible by the, the censors and maybe even uh, certain aspects of the public in terms of what their threshold was for being able to accept both the explicit nature of the content and the boldness of the experimental form. But these go hand in hand to the extent that you could even argue that the experimental form is a means through which he was able to smuggle these more radical ideas about sexuality that were challenging mainstream views. And through the experimental form, he was able to kind of get these things under the radar vis-a-vis -vis the censors. And you can even see that on the cover design of some of these books, where, for instance, uh, for pseudo science fiction stories and uh, for one other title we see here, they both have this label that labels them as qi huan wen shui, so kind of fantasy literature or even using science fiction here. And you even see on the cover in boldface of the pseudo science fiction stories, the qian wei shi yan yi wei, so the experimental spirit. That is the angle that was often overly emphasized where the queer element of these stories was kind of played down. And that was, again, a, almost a form of literary smuggling to get these things past the censors and using a form so radical, so strange, that hopefully the sexual content wouldn't raise any red flags among the censors. And so it was a very interesting kind of approach that Tsui took. And he was, again, very prolific. And he spent approximately 10 years writing fiction. Uh, it's also really interesting the way in which his career is very neatly divided into decade-long blocks. Um, and he talks about in this in, in, in the book about how he intentionally divided his career like this. So there's 10 years where he basically was a literary critic and published the, those scholarship on the U and, and other um, critical works, numerous peer-reviewed articles and academic journals. And so there's this tenure block of doing scholarship, a second tenure block as a fiction writer where he composed numerous novels such as these, but also several others, as well as many short stories. And then a third decade as an experimental filmmaker. And so this alone is also a very bold kind of career move. I don't know of many other artists. Uh, artists often will go through phases and maybe a realist phase or more experimental phase, uh, but to completely change mediums from scholarship to fiction to film over the course of your career in these kind of different chapters is something that is, I think, really stands alone as 
is something very few artists have, have kind of taken on this type of an approach. And when Sui turned to his career as a filmmaker, it was in the late 1990s. I believe his first directorial work was in 1999. And there's a technical reason for that, because this is the period in which we see the rise of digital filmmaking. DV cameras are finally cheap enough and accessible enough that average people can make them. And you don't need to rely on the expensive cameras for 16 millimeter or uh, even especially higher, higher resolution uh, film. And suddenly film becomes accessible to all. And so this is when Sui begins really making films as a DV kind of rogue filmmaker. And because the technology is so cheap and because he's teaching at Beijing Film Academy and has easy access to a lot of film students, both as crew members and as actors. He also employs a lot of non-professional actors in his films, but he's able to work on the cheap and easy and, and he's able to become extremely prolific. And he starts making at the height of his, uh, I guess the pro most prolific period of, of his career in the early 2000s, He's often making three or four feature length films a year in addition to numerous shorts. And so extremely active as a filmmaker. Um, the films have a certain rough aesthetic. Uh, they're not as polished and his, uh, his overall aesthetic vision is there's a crudeness to it, but that's also very much intentional in terms of trying to capture uh, the reality that was playing out around him, both in terms of the changes contemporary China was going through, and also the often very harsh living conditions that so many members of the gay community were experiencing in China during the late 80s into the early 2000s. His films sometimes also include elements of this science fiction universe and certainly include elements of the fantastic and the experimental, just as his fiction did. Uh, there are films with only two or three shots with, you know, with extended takes. There are films taking nonlinear approaches, uh, films using and playing aliens and uh, other sci-fi tropes. And so he's really kind of pushing the boundary with all of these films. And these are just a few of the works and many of them in exploring the lives of not just members of the queer community, but marginalized members. So prostitutes, um, kids that are young men that are pushed out of their home because and and kind of struggling to find their place in society um it's kind of an exploration of that world and more so than anyone else he becomes a figure sometimes looked at as almost the father of queer cinema in china during this period because he is so active he is so prolific he is also training a lot of younger filmmakers through these films giving voice to a whole new generation of young actors and really breaking new ground one thing again that's interesting is just as i talked about earlier how his fiction in China, the queerness is downplayed and the experimental nature is kind of augmented. When his films get distributed abroad, the opposite happens. And actually many of these films are picked up by niche, uh, niche um, queer distribution companies in Europe and in America and explicitly marketed to the queer community, especially during the era when DVDs were popular, uh, his films become some of the most distributed DVD productions of any Chinese filmmaker. In fact, there's a period in the early 2000s where there are more Tzuizan DVDs available on Amazon than Zhang Yimou DVDs that are available. Uh, his work also becomes the focus of a lot of academic studies internationally, um, especially in positions uh, in uh, academic journals like Positions. There are numerous peer-reviewed articles about Cui. There is translations of many of his short stories. And again, I think there's a real interesting relationship between the way in which as a quote-unquote queer filmmaker, that identity gives him more notice and more attention internationally in both academic communities and through 
the Queer Cinema International Film Festival Network and Home Video Distribution Network. That becomes a kind of selling point for many of his works, which brings him to a whole new audience. Whereas within China, a lot, around the same time, the voice of queer filmmakers is getting more and increasingly difficult to be heard, uh, to the point that eventually uh, Tsui leaves China and moves to Florida, where he spent the last several years. Uh, but I think it's definitely worth really thinking about in a serious way the different methods through which a filmmaker like Tsui Zhe'an is not only uh, distributed and received and marketed in China versus abroad, but the various factors that lead to that kind of a construction of his identity as a quote unquote uh, queer filmmaker. Besides his own films and his own uh, fiction, something else uh, that I want to emphasize in terms of really highlighting some of the unique contributions that Tsui has made is the fact that he was there on the ground floor during the birth of independent cinema in China. The origins of the sixth generation, this is kind of the late 90s, early 2000s. Again, he is an instructor at the Beijing Film Academy. And besides his own works, which I think are really a vital, he's not usually considered a member of the sixth generation per se, but his works are taking place at the same time. And I think they are a crucial part of the overall cultural moment in which independent cinema is rising in China. And besides his own works as a director and as a screenwriter, He's also contributing to numerous other filmmakers' careers. And so these are just three such examples. Uh, the films Welcome to Destination Shanghai, Men and Women, and Pirated Copy, all of which uh, Cui Zhe'an was involved with, either as a producer, actor, or a screenwriter. Uh, other films like East West Palace, East Palace, West Palace by Zhang Yuan, which is often considered the first quote-unquote queer film in Chinese film history. Some take issue with that, others don't. Uh, nevertheless, Cui Zan also had a role in that film. He had a role, he worked very closely with filmmakers like Wang Shaoshai and Zhang Yuan, the beginnings of their career. And this is also something he talks extensively about in our book. There's actually one chapter uh, that features Cui Zan in dialogue with not only myself, but also uh, Ning Dai, a screenwriter who worked, was Zhang Yuan's collaborator for the early phase of his career, also the sister of Ning Ying, the film director. And so the two of them in that chapter talk about the origins of independent film in China, which is also a really important record of some of the early moments in that history. And so uh, this is another area that Cui Zan has made an incredible contribution is to, that is the origins of independent film in China. And then you also have even Sui the documentarian, where besides as a creative force to be reckoned with in terms of his unbridled imagination, uh, there's also Sui who is documenting reality. And uh, and some of his documentary work includes uh, the documentary film Queer China, Comrade China, which is a very moving and fairly comprehensive uh, mm -hmm. film. Very much, A lot of it's kind of in the traditional talking head style, very different than the more wild and experimental form of some of his uh, fiction films. But this is a document uh, of many of the real pioneering figures in the queer rights movement in China. And so if you really want to understand on a deeper level uh, what it was like during that period in the 19, late 90s into the early 2000s, I think this film is a very important record. There's also We Are the dot, 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 Ellipsis of Communism, which is uh, another important documentary film reflecting on the legacy of socialism in contemporary China. And then also in his literary body of work, you have works uh, like this, uh, where on the right, this is a book that uh, is a kind of family history that Sui wrote, a chronicle of his parents' generation and his grandparents' generation. And so on multiple levels, Tsui is also documenting reality and history. And so all of this kind of comes together to create an incredibly complex picture of an artist who was at once an activist, a novelist, a scholar, a documentarian, 
uh, an incredibly an incredible writer who was always breaking new ground. And so through this this book of dialogues uh, that we recorded over the course of literally 15 years, uh, our hope is that we kind of shine light on these different facets of Tzu Zan and the different identities. And so when I joked at the beginning, will the real Tzu Zan stand up? Of course, they are all uh, indispensable parts of who he is as an artist, as a human being. And I especially like the way in which these different facets of his work, for instance, his research in traditional Chinese literature inform his films and inform his fiction, and the way in which uh, he adapts work from himself adaptation. For instance, Enter the Clowns, there is both a film version as well as a novel version. And this kind of dial the self-dialogue is also a really fascinating part of his body of work. And so uh, this book was published last year in Taiwan. And one unexpected result was the publisher, uh, because they got to know Tsui throughout that collaborative process, uh, went on and to publish the first traditional Chinese ed editions of two of his major novels, pseudo science fiction stories, and the novel Enter the Clowns. And so um, I'm quite happy that through our collaboration, not only have we kind of preserved this really important piece of history in terms of the contribution that Tsui Zan has made to queer culture in China, to film culture, literary culture, experimental uh, art in terms of what he's doing, but has also helped hopefully build constructive bridges between uh, the story of queer artists in China and the queer community in Taiwan by making these uh, works now available in Taiwan. And so I'm gonna keep my comments fairly short, but hopefully through this talk, I've been able to kind of shine a light on various aspects of Tsui Zan's remarkable career. And for those who are new to him, hopefully you've got a sense of the diversity of his uh, achievements and contributions. But for those who do maybe already know him, hopefully we've also uncovered some aspects and corners of his creative life that maybe uh, you were less familiar with. And of course, if you look at our book, there's a whole deeper world of his reflections on art and literature and religion and socialism uh, that are incredibly rewarding to to dive deeper into. So thank you for your time. Again, it's an honor to speak to the uh, Chinese Queer Voices workshop. And I look forward to hopefully seeing everyone in person at some future gathering. Thank you, everyone.